Peratt's model is a brilliant insight into trying to understand the dynamics of how Birkeland currents interact with each other. His simulations were done a long time ago and limited in terms of what he took into account. The model has clear and concise progression of how galaxies change over time into the different types that we see and connected when stars form inside the galaxy to a certain point of the galaxy's journey. As I produced the last two episodes, many questions started to arise about the model, what may not have been accounted for, and the implications for other concepts we have talked about in the past. This video will be more of a catalogue of all those questions, and I would also be interested in your opinion of what you think of the model and of my questions, and whether you have any additional questions as well. So let's dive in and ask some questions. So how it all starts. The flowing of the plasma sheets forming filaments which intertwine and form galaxies requires pre-existing magnetic fields and moving plasma relative to this field. And where did this field come from and where did the plasma itself come from? We believe that plasma is bunched along great filaments called the cosmic web. These seem to connect many parts of the universe across vast distances. One aspect to consider here is that of the elements. Pratt uses the principle of Markland convection to account for the distribution of hydrogen and explain why the core of galaxies contain higher metallicity. This does not rule out the role stars play in increasing this over time. But it must be remembered that in the plasma universe there is no Big Bang. So one interesting question that this raises is that of the distribution of elements throughout the visible universe. One question is how does this material get recycled once the energy driving it has halted and the galaxies fade? Would this lead to an ever increasing higher metallicity in stars and galaxies? Or is there some other mechanism that allows for the breaking down of large atoms back to hydrogen and helium to maintain a steady ratio? Equally possible I suppose is that there is no such mechanism and what we see now just happens to be the ratio at that stage but that then does mean that there is a finite limit to the ability of the universe to continue producing stars and galaxies. Once all the hydrogen and helium is converted into large atoms, then how would this affect the flowing of plasma and the eventual production of galaxies and stars? How it all ends. Now the implication is that this is like a cascade where the filaments form as the plasma moves through the magnetic field which drives the current flow. At some stage, this EMF stops driving the current. The current will continue to flow for a considerable time, but eventually stops. What is left behind? In Peratt's model, the rotation of the galaxy comes from the twisting Birkeland currents, but the material in the galaxies is largely neutralized material compared to the original filament. So the question is whether this has a serious implication for the galaxies or not. The connection between electromagnetic effects and gravity. Connected to this is the idea that as the galaxies start to form, more neutral material will form inside the galaxy. Peratt explains the rotation of the spiral galaxies by the rotation of the filament. The plasma is confined within the ice bars and forced to rotate around it. This force is vastly larger than that of gravity, and is a different way of explaining the rotation problem of galaxies where a gravity model cannot account for this without requiring a liberal sprinkling of dark matter throughout the galaxy. The problem that I believe was not modelled is what happens to this neutral matter as it forms. It would not feel the influence of the magnetic force and would only feel the effect of gravity, and would therefore not follow the same path. As more material coalesces in the core, this matter will start to feel a stronger gravitational attraction. Could this offset the difference? Assuming that at some stage the EMF stops, what happens to the galaxy? A large portion is still really as plasma, with a portion as neutral matter. The double layer has now disappeared, so the question is what keeps the material bound together? Is this only gravity by this stage? The limitations of the model. Now this is a 2D only model, and galaxies are 3D structures, so are we missing something in this? His simulations were based on the idea that material would form and become compressed at the double layer which formed along the filament. The simulations only looked at a two-dimensional slice across the filament 
where the double layer formed. When we examine galaxies, we know that they are not two-dimensional structures, and therefore this means that there is a dynamic that is not being modelled. The two-dimensional simulations give good analogy of what appear like galaxies, but does not model any behaviour that must happen above and below this double layer. If we examine the basic properties of a double layer, we see that often in the areas he models, it appears they will form beams of ions in one direction and electrons in the opposite. These flows are not modelled in this simulation. One other aspect to consider is the three-dimensional change that must be occurring to the entire filament due to the interactions. Assuming that the ions are being compressed and start forming the nucleus, and later the spiral arms, what is happening outside of the double layer? The overall timescales for his simulation end-to-end -end was between 2 billion and 200 million years. So this raises the question as to whether we observe any galaxies that have gone beyond the stage of having an active EMF driving it. What would they look like? Why does the material in the sump get compressed in the first place? This relates to the limitations of the modelling in 2D. As the two Birkeland currents approach each other, magnetic field lines between these form an ever-decreasing space which compresses the material between the filaments. The assumption is of course that this material between the filaments is largely plasma, otherwise they would not feel any effect from these fields. Pratt does not really stipulate what the density is of the material between the filaments. What is also not clear is whether this space would actually be a three-dimensional shape between the two filaments, and why when it is compressed inwards it would not retain this three-dimensional shape just squashed in the x and z directions. The size of the filaments. Peratt uses the width of the Cygnus A as his width of an average intergalactic filament. This is obviously an assumption as we don't really observe the material that makes up this filament. There is some tentative evidence of the size of some of the filaments between some of the Abel cluster galaxies, but these would appear to be significantly wider. When we examine stellar filaments, there does seem to be a very clear size ratio for these filaments. So the question is why these larger filaments remain so large. In Peratt's laboratory experiments he showed that plasma sheets had a tendency to create smaller filaments, which would tend to bunch together over time. So what determines this size? Is there a more stable larger size, or would it naturally want to filament down to smaller sizes? If we examine the Abel cluster plasma flow, would we expect to find smaller filaments within this larger flow, forming the smaller filaments which interact forming the galaxies. Joining of filaments. In Peratt simulations, the filaments never actually join, but just spiral around each other. In his laboratory experiments, he clearly saw that plasma sheets form many small filaments, which later join together into a few larger ones. The question is, are the filaments used in this simulation those later ones, or the earlier ones, and is it possible to have the entire filament joined together? The question of the return circuit of the current. We briefly touched on this at the beginning, but in order for the model to work, there has to be a return circuit for the current. I've discussed this concept when we looked at Alvin's double layer paper. He speculated that this could well return through other filaments elsewhere. Now this is a plausible concept, but it is never explained how this could be achieved. Are there pre-existing filaments that act as old pathways to carry this back? And this leads to another question about the rotation of the filaments. As the filaments form, they attract each other, and the attraction and repulsive forces cause the filaments to spiral around each other, but if we assume a closed circuit, that would also mean that the ends of the filaments are tethered at both ends. And this makes the continued rotation of the filament almost impossible. If the filaments cannot rotate, there can be no galaxy rotation in this model. Another possibility is that we need to consider either ends like an anode and a cathode, and that the filament forms between these two points, but is capable of moving across the surface of either of these to allow it to twist. This effectively means there is a difference in potential between the two distant points. There would still have to be a return circuit elsewhere connected to both the cathode and anode, and forcing the current to flow in the opposite direction. Peratt used the idea that plasma moving through a pre-existing magnetic field could provide the EMF to drive this current through the circuit.
This still leaves the question of what created the magnetic fields that caused this effect. Now what about those jets? One aspect of Peratt's model is the fact that radio galaxies do not actually have jets, but that these are simply plasma sheets that are created due to the isobars trapping material. This at first seems an elegant solution to the problem of the superluminal flows from these structures. The problem I see is that when the spiral galaxy form, these jets will be angled out of the spiral arms rather than out of the spin axis of the galaxy. And yet, there are examples of spiral galaxies with jets out of the axis of rotation, which would not match Peratt's model then. Then there is also the issue of whether the material flows out of the jets or not. Some images do seem to suggest no motion, but instead a steady dimming of the entire structure, but there are examples where it is hard to deny that there is clearly motion occurring. If we examine M87, which Peratt quotes as his example of dimming, and no motion, this is indeed true for some parts of the jet, but also not true for other parts of the jet. 3C264 also shows little motion, but rather a brightening and dimming of parts of the jet. But 3C279 shows very clear motion in the material of the jet. What about Eric Lerner's quasar plasmoid model? I find it a little ironic that Peratt clearly states that he did not model the plasma in the sump, and refers to Eric Lerner's work in the study of this type of plasma. As some of you will know, Eric Lerner's plasmoid quasar model is based on the experiments he performed in his lab. He found that small plasmoids were created from a plasma sheet that forms filaments. These plasmoids would contain beams that ejected material out of both poles. He viewed that this, in all likelihood, was what we see when we examine quasars and the cores of galaxies. Not a supermassive black hole, but a plasmoid. So why is it ironic that he refers to Lerner? Well, Perak clearly states that he does not believe the jets that we are seeing are ejected material. He gives the example of M87, but this is formed in exactly the region that was not modelled in his simulation, and Eric's model clearly does have material ejecting from it. So both cannot be correct. Halton Art's work. If you are not familiar with Halton Art's work, you might want to check out my ARP evidence series. In a nutshell, he catalogued many examples of parent galaxies with quasars that seem to be located on either the major or minor axis. He also felt that some galaxies were actively ejecting material which formed into quasars and eventually into companion galaxies. Peratt claimed that his simulations would be able to account for this correlation due to the appearance of multiple quasars at some stages as the sump compressed the material inwards. He does not really expand much on this in his paper, and I find this one of the hardest things to see in his simulations. ARP showed clear evidence of the spiral safic galaxies having these quasars across the axis, yet by that stage of Peratt's simulation, there are no bridges seen nor visible signs of this in the isobars he shows in his paper. A lot of the quasar associations Halt and Arp saw were across the major axis, and if this is a safer galaxy, that is not something that is possible in Peratt's model, as these would lie above and below the double layer and images he shows. The case against Markarian 205 and NGC 4319. Peratt uses this as an example of multiple interacting galaxies. If we examine an image of this merger, the first thing you will notice is the difference in size and the stage of their development. NGC 4319 has clear spiral arms, and Markarian 205 seems to be nestled in one of the arms of NGC 4319. This raises the question about how this could be possible if these are two pairs of filaments, as they cannot overlap each other. It may be possible that Markarian 205 is forming much further down the filament and it just appears that they are close to each other. But then this would not be an example of a galaxy interaction and that does not address the question of the filament connecting Markarian 205 and NGC 4319. If we then examine Markarian 205 we see that this also has two quasars that seem to be associated and connected to Markarian 205 via hydrogen filaments. The problem of redshift. Now this leads on to a rather sticky issue of redshift. 
As I pointed out in the comparison of EU and Plasma Universe, Parat has not commented on what he thinks causes the redshift of objects. It is clear he does not believe in the Big Bang, and I can therefore only assume it's something similar to tired light, meaning higher redshift is further away. This is obvious when you look at the size of the quasars and some of the galaxies that he uses as size comparison. Now, Pratt does not specifically talk about the origins of what is the visible universe, but one way I could see this matching up to the idea of redshift still being related to distance is that our visible universe formed from the same plasma flowing across magnetic fields, which formed vast sheets which turned into filaments, which then interact and form galaxies. This would mean that the more redshifted an object we observe would be from the far edges of these plasma sheets, and due to the speed of light we would be seeing these in an early stage compared to our local neighbourhood. This does however raise a question about the elements in the intergalactic plasma. Now assuming that they are not simply hydrogen, but as discussed a mixture of different elements that get radially separated, where were these elements created? Parat and others in the plasma universe have focused very much on extrapolating backwards from observable and measurable science, but so far have not really addressed the question of how these processes might either have been a one-off or more likely a repeating pattern, and if so, on what scale. To me, it makes more sense to consider his model with the idea that redshift is related more to either the electron density, so plasma redshift, or some aspect of the magnetic compression of the plasma in the filament. This removes the link to distance and would mean many quasars are in fact much closer as Holt and Art believed. It would however change some of his fundamental assumptions and does not remove the problem of quasars being associated across the major axis of a galaxy. What about Alphane's galactic circuit? Although Peratt builds on much of the work done by Hannes Alphane, one area he seems to be stepping aside from is that of the galactic circuit. This was a mechanism for explaining how the current would flow in a galaxy, out of the poles and in at the spiral arms, and it was largely based on the work Alphane had done on the solar circuit. In Peratt's model there simply is no need for it, and it would have introduced the concept of current flowing out of the poles and in at the arms, and his model is purely based on the idea that the energy comes from the filaments and the interaction between them. The galaxy appears in between the filaments and the rotation is provided by the rotation of the filaments across the centre. Can we extend this concept to star filaments? One of the fundamental tenets of the plasma universe is the idea that the concepts can scale up. Alphane came up with the idea of the solar circuit and scaled this up to the galactic scale to explain how galaxies function. As we have already discussed, Peratt does away with the galactic circuit, meaning equally he must do away with the solar circuit. The logical question would be that if we see filaments forming in the arms of galaxies, then surely a similar mechanism of filaments interacting must occur as well. Yet in his paper he steers very much away from this and falls back on simple pinching being enough to cause the collapse of the material to form a star. And yes, that's a thermonuclear star. This seems a somewhat strange oversight, given the idea that it must scale. It does create the rather interesting idea that stars would form in between filaments, but would be an alternative way of explaining some of the phenomena that we see with young stars. One thing we do know for sure is that young stars absolutely do eject material along jets, so this is something to consider if this is a scalable model. Galaxies that defy the model, there are examples of some galaxy mergers that would be very hard to explain in this model. One example, NGC 4038, shows what appears as two galaxies colliding. The problem is the opposite direction of the two streams and the fact that they cross over each other. And this would require the two filaments to physically cross over each other. Assuming that these two galaxies formed from the same plasma sheet, which formed filaments close by, why would the rotation of one be different to the other? There is also the example of a spiral galaxy which has jets from its major axis, which does not fit this model as well. Now what does it mean for the EU? 
Now this is an interesting question. I see Peratt's idea often shown as an example of how galaxies would form. The Electric Universe is very much aligned to Halton Arp's concept of galaxies being capable of ejecting material to form new galaxies. So this is immediately at odds with the basic concept of Peratt outlined in his paper. The Electric Universe also holds that galaxies are powered by the Birkeland currents, not by the rotation of the filaments about one another. In Peratt's model, the galaxies form between two filaments, so it would not be powered by the filament itself. Although it is possible that these filaments are forming inside a much larger filament like Peratt saw in his experiments. This does raise the question of how a galaxy would form inside a filament in the Electric Universe model. This could still be similar to Lerner's plasmoid model, where the pinch compresses the plasma, forming initially what appears as the quasar, and then later develops into a galaxy. But it is important to realise that Lerner's model did not form in a filament, nor require the filament to form or be powered by it. And this is an example of where I referred to the lack of documentation in the Electric Universe. Peratt's model clearly explains how galaxies evolve from one observable state to another, and clearly explains how and when the stars form within it. So far, I have not seen this for the Electric Universe, other than referring loosely to Peratt's model without explaining how they might have modified it. Einstein rings. Now, one last thing this model makes me consider is that of the Einstein rings, where we see the supposed repeating pattern that often seems to reflect across certain areas. Is it possible that these are examples of looking down the barrel of one of these interacting filaments, where the outer sheath is being bent and compressed into a narrow region? Could this plasma then form smaller filaments, like he saw in his laboratory experiments, which appear as the repeating galaxies? Overall, Peratt's model has a lot that we need to start considering, but there are still many outstanding questions this raises that have, as far as I know, not been addressed anywhere. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.